Let's talk about momentum. Momentum. Um, so momentum uh, is quite simply the quantity of motion. So, um, way back when, Isaac Newton um, was sort of uh, one of the main kind of studiers of the concept of momentum. Um, and so the definition of momentum is, um, well, it looks like this. So P is the symbol for momentum and is the mass of an object multiplied by its velocity. P equals M times V. Okay? So very simply, if we want to calculate an object's momentum, we do a little multiplication. So if I said calculate the momentum uh, of a 10 kilogram mass traveling at negative 10 meters per second. Okay. What does the negative mean here? It's the direction, right. So if we were to lay out a number line where positive is to the right, negative just means it's traveling to the left. So 10 kilograms times 10 meters per second, you get 100, you get 100 units of momentum. And there's no specific unit of momentum, it just keeps the units that uh, went into it. So it's kilogram meters per second. Okay. Oftentimes, uh, people confuse inertia with momentum. Um, they're they're different, right? Um, so, like, if like a big heavy football player is running towards you, um, you know, they have essentially the tendency to stay in motion, as Newton's first law states. But they also have a large amount of um, momentum, right? So whatever velocity they're running at multiplied by their mass. This is inertia, right? Inertia is just one part of that. That is resistance to change in motion. Momentum in this form doesn't really look at how something got its velocity, right? It just looks simply at what the velocity is multiplied by what the mass is, okay? So why is momentum useful? Well, on its own, knowing an object's momentum as a number value doesn't really do a whole heck of a lot for you, really. Um, so you wouldn't often hear anyone out there in the world say like, oh, that football player has, you know, 2,000 kilogram meters per second worth of momentum, okay? But where it does become important is in the concept of conservation of momentum, okay? And we'll get to that in just a second. Before we do that, though, I want to talk about impulse. You may have studied impulse a little bit in uh, grade 10, but impulse is change in momentum. So impulse is the change in momentum. And this is kind of a little bit more uh, useful if you want. So the change in P. And by the way, that's the symbol for momentum, P. I don't know why it's P, it just is. Okay. So the way to write this mathematically is like this. I impulse equals M. Uh, sorry, I'm going to write that even more basically. Okay, so impulse is equal to a change in momentum. Okay. Well, let's go even further and break that up. I equals delta MV. Are you with me so far? P equals mv, then this should be true. The thing is, how often do you think in a momentum change the mass of the object is changing? It could happen. It could, like say, uh, say you're like on a truck and that truck is full of pumpkins and you're driving along in the truck at some velocity or the truck's rolling along even. There's no the gas isn't being pressed, you could technically change the momentum of this truck if you start to toss the pumpkins 
you know, off the back of the truck. Okay. So yeah, sometimes the mass could could change. All right, but it's very rare. Usually when we're talking about a momentum change, we're really talking about something changing its velocity, right? Um, for, the, for the most part, for you and I, for many objects, their mass is sort of set by what they are, right? Um, so what that means is, we just look at what delta actually represents. What does delta actually represent? Well, it, it's mv final, right, minus mv initial. Is it not? Delta notation just means final minus initial. So if you want to expand this way back here, you could say final momentum minus initial momentum. Okay? So we could have that. And then we could actually change that over to being M VF minus uh, VI. Right? We can pull the M out of here. And we get this scenario, right? So impulse is really, as long as the mass is not, not changing, it's what changes the velocity of a mass. So here's a question. What does change the velocity of a mass? What do we need to do in order to change the velocity of something with mass? What's the only way to change the velocity of something with mass? You have to accelerate it. Absolutely. So that must mean, in order to have an impulse, force must be applied, okay? So somewhere in this scenario, force needs to come into the picture. Well, it turns out that Newton, Newton sorted this out, that if you apply a force to an object for some amount of time, and this is a net force, by the way, it's got to be a net force, so you apply a, a net force to an object for some amount of time, you are going to change its momentum. Just think about that. If I apply a net force to an object, I'm going to change its momentum. Okay? So that is impulse. All right? So another equivalency that we could write down while we're going is we could say that impulse is equal to a force applied, a net force applied to an object for some amount of time. Okay? So there's another definition. Um, of impulse. And if this is true, then we should be able to substitute in F net times T. That's not a subtraction, that's times T. F times T in for this. So what we get then is we get this. Force applied for a time causes a mass to change its velocity. Okay? I'm going to tell you a secret. This is actually Newton's second law, just written slightly differently. Um, Newton actually phrased his initial writing uh, in terms of momentum, and it's strictly in terms of change of momentum. Okay, so watch how this becomes the way that we're familiar with. Force must equal m v f minus vi over t. So mass times vf minus vi divided by t. Well, what's delta v over t the same as? Right. So for this time period, and it's a, it's a time period, it's not an instant in time, that wouldn't make sense. We're saying we're applying a force for some amount of time. You actually can work your way right back to the familiar way of writing Newton's second law. Okay, so we've come full circle here. Now, what what takeaways do I want you to get from this? Okay, well, one to change a momentum, you need an impulse. Okay. Two, um, impulse is force applied for some time.
okay? And three, if we want that in terms of an equation, um, there's numerous ways to write it, but probably the one that you'll end up using the most is this, ft equals m delta v. Okay, so let's do an example problem. So here's a question. You're traveling at 27 meters per second. This is 100 kilometers per hour, okay? So you're traveling at highway speeds in a car. You happen to weigh 80 kilograms. What amount of impulse must be applied to stop you? So if you're stopped, what's your momentum? Yeah, when you're stopped, if your velocity equals zero, then your momentum equals zero, okay? So that's kind of an important thing to think about. Um, so we know that impulse is equal to m final velocity minus initial velocity. And in this case, the impulse is acting in the opposite direction to your momentum, right? The impulse is in the opposite direction to your momentum. So the way this is this is set up, the assumption is that you have a positive um, momentum to begin with, and that will end up giving you um, a negative impulse, which just means it's in the opposite direction to the way that you're going. Okay, so your mass is 80, and you've got zero minus 27 meters per second. Oh, I should say that's kilograms. So we get that you need negative 216 kilogram meters per second worth of impulse. What? Sorry? Is that better? Sorry. Uh, yeah, 1600 plus 560. Gotcha. All right, so anyway, notice the units. What units are those in? The same units as? as momentum. And that should make sense because impulse is change in momentum. Remember, this is the change in momentum. So this is the same as the momentum that the person originally had. So you must apply an impulse equal to that in order to bring them to a stop, okay? That's part A of this problem. Part B is, let's think about the ways that you could come to a stop if you're driving in a car. The preferred way is to use the brakes, right? If you turn your brakes on, roughly how long would it say that you come to a stop over from highway speeds? Like 10 seconds? Four seconds? Five seconds? Let's say it's five seconds. So you see, uh, you know, you see a yellow light, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000, five, 1,000, and you come to a stop. That's fairly heavy braking, but it's not too bad, okay? That's, that's way one, that's option one. Option two, well, we don't really like option two, but option two is you hit something. Um, so like you're not paying attention or someone pulls out in front of you. Um, so we could say collision. You could almost come, you could always come to a stop with a collision. It's not ideal, but it could happen. So let's think of two collision scenarios. Let's say the collision is in an older car, and that older car does not have crumple zones, and that older car does not have airbags. Okay? So if you're coming to a stop essentially when the metal frame of your car connects with the metal frame of the other car or the tree or whatever it is that you happen to hit, and you come to a stop in a very short amount of time. Like, I'm thinking, like, what if you come to a stop in an, um, what's reasonable? Half a second? I would say probably even less than that. Yeah, let's say, uh, let's say you probably come to a stop in this scenario in a tenth of a second, maybe. And let's say that you do, right, you do come to a stop in a, mo or you get in a collision in a modern car. So you have a couple of other scenarios, right? So in a modern car, you have a crumple zone. So the front end of your car, as you drive into something, crumples up like a can. That serves to extend the time that you come to a stop over, right? 
it lengthens the time the impulse acts over. And let's also say that you have an airbag. So here's your steering wheel, right? You know, your head hits into the airbag. And this also serves to bring your head to a stop in a longer period of time than, say, the steering wheel would, right? So let's say that the collision, uh, let's say that this extends to um, one second, one one thousand. That's pretty violent. Let's go with one second, okay? Now what I want to know is what is the difference in force in all of these scenarios? What force is exerted on, you know, the person driving in each of these, in each of these scenarios? Now remember, impulse is equal to force times time, okay? The force and the impulse, um, I guess, are directed in the same direction, right? Um, so we have this negative value. Um, if we just now assume that this is the amount of impulse applied, we don't really need to carry the negative down, right? So we, we just know that impulse is 2160. Force K is whatever force happens to turn out to be. And we've got five seconds in scenario one, scenario 2A. We have this. And in three, we have this. Uh, oops, 1.0 seconds. Okay, and remember the units of this is kilograms meters per second. So let's solve each of these and see how we can vary the force that we receive in a collision. Because you can't change the impulse. You're coming to a stop. The impulse is set by what you weigh and what you were traveling at. Okay, what you can control hopefully, is the time over which you come to a stop. You want to make that as long as possible to minimize the forces on your body. High forces on your body cause internal injuries, damage, broken bones, and so on, right? Um, all the sorts of bad things that happen in a car accident. So let's calculate these out. Okay, so some quick math can show um, pretty high variability in the amount of forces you um, receive, um, you know, within like a pretty small time frame, right? Um, the difference between, you know, 0.1 sec, you know, a crash happening over 0.1 second versus one second um, varies the amount of force on your body by 10 times. Um, I mean, that's probably not surprising, but maybe it is a bit surprising. I don't know, one second is not very long. Um, so variation within that one second can really mean the difference between living and dying. Let's, um, Let's just do one more thing with this now that we have it. Can we use these numbers to figure out what accelerations this person is, is undergoing? We should be able to, right? Because we know this, back to Newton's laws, we're kind of tying them all in together here, but we know this, right? So if we want to find accelerations, all we need is the force divided by the mass. So in the case of this person, they're weighing 80 kilograms, right? So we should be able to sort out what acceleration they're undergoing. Um, so all we would have to do is divide each one by the mass. So we'll write those in. So clearly a uh, pretty wide variety in, in, in accelerations that a person can experience in a car crash. Um, something as a little bit of a side note, uh, the concept of the G kind of comes into play here. So the concept of the G, or some people say G-force, the G, or G-force. Well, if one G on Earth equals 9.8 meters per second squared, that's the acceleration due to gravity, we can calculate the number of Gs in each of these by just, say, taking the acceleration and dividing it by 9.8. So in this case, you get just over half a G, in this case, you get roughly close to 28 Gs. Um, and in this case, you'd get about 2.7 Gs, okay? Um, an interesting question is, what is the max number of Gs a human can survive? 
And it's sort of an open question, right? You can't really take humans and subject them to G's. You can't, like, take a person and strap them in a chair and smash them into a wall and see how, like, how fast you can do that and how many times you can do it before they die. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit of an open question. Um, you kind of have to look at data from car crashes and try to calculate it. And that's the end of the lesson. <laughs>